thank you for the invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure and honor uh, to be here. It's, it's right uh, that to travel a few miles more than you did, but uh, uh, it's, it's really interesting uh, to be here at uh, Capitol Hill and uh, exchange uh, views and ideas on, on the rule of law. And um, I think it's also very interesting and uh, necessary that uh, we need to discuss these issues uh, on a broader basis, on a more international level. Uh, and in this respect, I'm glad to, to be here and uh, to, to further our discussions and uh, debates uh, between Europe and, and the United States. Uh, well, let me tell you uh, briefly about uh, my experiences uh, in my uh, political uh, career so far on uh, rule of law issues. And uh, uh, what comes to mind is, uh, is a quote that uh, a well-known historian uh, made a few years ago. Uh, you might remember that uh, he said, uh, history is over. History is over. And uh, what he said, what he meant basically is that these Western-style republics uh, with uh, liberal democracy uh, as a political system, with the market economy as our economic system, and the rule of law as our legal system, as, you know, these main pillars of living together, that this system has won, has won the, the course of history, and that there is no further way to go. Well, uh, in the meanwhile, we know uh, it's not the case. Uh, history is not over. Uh, all these accomplishments, uh, all these achievements that we might have made in, in, uh, in a few Western countries um, do not rule the global order. They have not uh, won history yet. And uh, quite on the contrary, I think, in my experiences, um, that uh, these achievements that we've made are rather on the retreat rather than uh, winning. And uh, my perspective uh, that I uh, what I bring in is uh, obviously uh, not American, uh, but uh, European. And uh, I want to look at it from a European perspective, uh, from Europe and its neighborhood. And if you look around Europe, you see in the East Russia, uh, let's put it directly, it's, it's a dictatorship. Uh, if you look uh, further to the South, uh, Turkey, I mean, Turkey gave a few glimmers of hope a couple of years ago, but now it's uh, sliding into a dictatorship as well. We have uh, we had the Arab Spring, also gave us some hope a few years back. Uh, well, uh, not quite so hopeful anymore. Um, unfortunately, the Arab Spring has uh, has collapsed basically and uh, didn't work out. Uh, uh, as you all hoped. This is basically the, the environment, the neighborhood of Europe. If you look into Europe itself, uh, we have a lot of troubles uh, right now in the European Union. Uh, we've faced uh, troubles in uh, Hungary, we now have, uh, which is very high on the agenda, uh, troubles uh, with Poland. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, um, let me just uh, briefly explain uh, what happens. Uh, and that's very well um, related to, to our topic of today, to the rule of law. Uh, what happened in Hungary and what is happening right now in Poland is basically the government trying to get the judiciary under control. Uh, and um, what we've just heard before uh, from a, a fellow a congressman that uh, the original idea of, of a democratic, uh, liberal constitution is to split power as much as you can, horizontally as well as vertically. I mean, that's by the government taking over the, judici the judiciary. That's exactly uh, what this centralization of power uh, means. And so that's exactly what they want to achieve by this. 
they want to uh, <coughs> increase their power, they want to uh, further power, and an independent judiciary is obviously in the way. And uh, the obvious way to do is, well, get it under control politically, stuff the judiciary, the courts, and the public prosecution with the colonies, uh, and then from their uh, point of view, you have a lot of troubles solved. But it's not just Eastern Europe, and it's not just uh, black and white. And we've heard a lot about Eastern Europe and, and the troubles and, uh, and the rule of law. And uh, we've just heard before that uh, rather than privatization, we should have told Eastern European countries after the fall of the Iron Curtain, rule of law, rule of law, rule of law. And that's absolutely right. And uh, it didn't quite happen that way. Uh, and uh, to be honest, we, we need to acknowledge that uh, accepting all those countries uh, into the European Union where the rule of law is a pillar of, uh, of its constitution, basically, was way too early. Um, at a stage, uh, at a time when this, rule of law, when this rule of law was still not uh, fully accomplished and achieved in these countries. But again, it's not just a difference between Western European countries and Eastern European countries. It's not white and black. We should not deceive ourselves in, in thinking that uh, if it's a Western European country, all is white and perfect and soft, and the rule of law is established and no problem at all. And uh, but this is not the case uh, I want to explain to you. Uh, in, a, well, in, a, in a case study, you can say, or, uh, or what has uh, what I've been working on uh, over the last uh, two to three years, and uh, this is uh, what has been already mentioned: uh, the case of Hyper by Adria, which is a bank uh, headquartered in Austria. Actually, originally, historically, a small lender of uh, yeah, real estate loans, uh, very small even Austrian standards. Um, and uh, this small bank has been turned over the years um, into a well, middle-sized bank with a total balance sheet of uh, over 40 billion uh, euros and uh, a network of subsidiaries spanning uh, 12 countries, uh, Austria and basically most of Eastern European countries. And, uh, well, the, the end of the story uh, was not that well. Uh, the, the bank had to be bailed out, um, was taken over by the Austrian government in 2009. And um, as happened many times, the cost uh, went to the taxpayers. And uh, the cost is roughly 15 billion euros to the Austrian taxpayers. And uh, I leave aside the cost to the German taxpayers. Uh, not to make it too complicated. But just to put it into com in comparison, $15 billion to the Austrian taxpayers means roughly 600 million US dollars uh, to the US taxpayer, caused by one single bank. And uh, this should not be confused with any bailout that happened during the financial crisis. This has nothing to do with the financial crisis, uh, to be uh, precise. And why is this case so different uh, from any other bank? Well, because it's, uh, it's never been a bank in the first place. It's never been a bank. Why not? Because a bank usually, if it gives out loans, usually tries to have the loans paid back at some point in time. But this organization, let's call it that way, um, has never been interested in actually getting the loans back. And um, you might wonder, how is that possible? Why was that the case? And, um, well, let me briefly describe uh, in, a, in a few words um, how it worked. 
It was basically the bank handing out loans uh, without collateral. And um, uh, if, if necessary, uh, the, valuation, uh, the valuations made by experts were, were faked. And uh, most of the money uh, has not been uh, returned to the bank. And it uh, disappeared in uh, various channels. And uh, the, the beneficiaries of, of all these loans uh, were disguised, basically, were, were hidden by uh, shell companies uh, in Liechtenstein. Uh, well, not only Liechtenstein, but uh, Liechtenstein uh, um, was uh, at the center uh, of, uh, of, this, uh, of these transactions uh, with Freeport Bavaria. So what happened is basically that uh, uh, officially, the, the money was uh, taken out by a project company. Project company said, we will build something very nice and beautiful and in Austria or in Eastern Europe, a hotel, um, apartment blocks. Got the money without collateral. Um, and uh, these project companies that uh, belong to, to shell companies in Liechtenstein, uh, managed by uh, trustees, and as you know, with these kind of companies, well, they don't really belong to someone, at least legally. Um, so the interesting question is, well, who are the beneficiaries? Who are the ones who actually benefit still uh, from, from this enterprise, even if there's no legal owner? And uh, this, that this was made, that these transactions, or many of these transactions was made by Liechtenstein is no coincidence. There was... Uh, um, done this way on purpose. And as I said, the only and uh, the, the, the only cause or the only interest that why, why this was made this way is um, to take advantage of anonymity. To that these beneficiaries of these payments, of these loans, could remain anonymous. And uh, that's what Liechtenstein and a few other uh, countries uh, offer its anonymity. Okay, institutions, companies, structures that allow uh, you to remain anonymous. That's not per se legal. And not all of the people obviously using these structures do anything illegal. But it still can be abused. Uh, and in this case, uh, it was abused uh, 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 tremendously. Um, I call it very often modern day bank robbery, because uh, you know, bank robbery uh, with a few armed guys uh, storming into the bank and doing this violently and being chased by, by the police, I mean, that's really old style, old style if you look at these, uh, these structures. Uh, modern day style bank robbery works this way, uh, there's no violence involved, there's, con there's collusion uh, with a few bank managers and uh, people outside the bank. Um, the bank robbery is uh, hidden behind uh, what is official transactions that are financed by the bank. Uh, the money uh, flows away into uh, Liechtenstein bank accounts and, uh, well, no one knows uh, uh, who got all this money. And uh, we, we had this investigation uh, committee in the Austrian parliament uh, because uh, obviously uh, we wanted to know also as, as parliamentarians why is it that this happened and why is it that the Austrian taxpayers eventually has to pay uh, this bill and uh, what has been done about it and uh, can it be prevented in the future. And so this is not only a financial scandal, it's also uh, a legal scandal. It's a scandal from uh, the point of view uh, rule of law. And why is this the case? Because uh, what we've discovered uh, during our investigation in the Austrian parliament uh, is, uh, well, as I said, it's not only a loss to the taxpayers uh, in the amount of 15, roughly 15 billion euros. It's also that uh, 
well, call it the bank robbers, all these people who set up all these uh, uh, smart uh, ideas and uh, constructions to basically steal the money. Uh, that most of them are still at large. Uh, and that from the point of view of a working legal system, um, not much or nothing has been done. Let me give a few examples of that. Um, because I've, uh, I've been speaking about Poland before and, and the independent courts, well, actually, whether the, the courts are independent, whether the, the judges are independent is entirely irrelevant uh, if the state, the public prosecution is politicized. So if you can exercise control over the public prosecutors, it's totally irrelevant uh, whether the, the courts are independent or not. And uh, several ways uh, can, uh, can be um, uh, can be done to, to achieve this. Well, first of all, and that's actually even before controlling, or well, maybe it's still a way of controlling the, the public uh, prosecutors, uh, and that's about finance, that's about resources. You can control the course of public prosecution uh, depending on how much resources you provide them with, or not. And in the case of Hubert Beatia, uh, which is uh, the, the biggest criminal case Austria or uh, even Europe has ever been uh, uh, confronted with. Uh, the resources of the, of the state, uh, of the public prosecutors, were really limited. Uh, there were only three prosecutors uh, dealing with this case, and it's, it's a big case. There, are a few, there were a few law firms uh, uh, supporting the criminal police, which basically um, does the, the first investigation before it comes uh, to a public prosecution. Uh, and uh, and the, the criminal police was supported uh, by, by private law firms. And just one single private law firm, which dealt with about 20% of the cases, had up to 30 lawyers working on the case. 30 lawyers for 20% of the cases. So you can imagine what happens if you just uh, have three public prosecutors working on the case. Uh, and uh, we should not assume that this is pure incompetence or a mistake. This, uh, this was done on, on purpose. Um, the public prosecutors uh, were given an advisor, an economic advisor, because obviously, obviously it was a, a difficult case uh, to handle with, and so they were given an advisor. Turns out uh, that this advisor has been working for the bank before, has advised the bank, which is an obvious conflict of interest. And this is just one example. All this case is uh, just stuffed with conflicts of interests everywhere. Um, and the uh, last um, example that I want to give is, uh, uh, I don't know if there's any corresponding uh, criminal offense in the US, but uh, uh, in, the, in the Austrian uh, uh, criminal um, law, there's, uh, there's an offense called breach of trust. And it basically means that uh, if you breach a trust of your, of your organization that you're responsible for as a, as a manager or, as, or some other person, uh, um, having been given this trust, and you do it in a way that damages uh, the company, damages the, the company's assets, that's a criminal offense. Um, and that's the only criminal offense that has ever been prosecuted, uh, which is actually a rather minor or mild offense, considering the, the largest uh, of this case and actually what has been going on. Um, and why is that also interesting from a legal perspective and from the perspective of, of rule of law? Well, if you just prosecute as a state a uh, breach of trust, you don't need to follow the, the money. You don't need to investigate where the money went. 
because that's not necessary to prove for this criminal offense. The only thing you need to prove is breach of trust. Uh, and if you do this, you can sentence a few matches, and that happened. Uh, but as I said, only a few people in only a few minor cases. Uh, the, the largest cases where really millions and millions uh, disappeared um, are until now simply untouched or have been shelved uh, until uh, the, the uh, statute of limits limitation uh, come, uh, comes into play. So, if, if you look at this as, as a parliamentarian, uh, but also from uh, the perspective of a, of a citizen, you can only be outraged um, that this happened. Uh, and, and not only that it happened, but the fact that there were hardly any legal consequences. That, and you can call them bankrolls, uh, because that's what they are, that they're still at large. And you must imagine how this feels to the, to the ordinary citizens who observe this and realize that uh, when they do something wrong in their ordinary life, uh, the state is very quick with sanctions. But then, uh, if the, the trouble is uh, millions and billions of euros, then you know, nothing seems to happen. And uh, the billions are gone. Nobody cares where they're gone. I mean, they're still there. It's just that the ownership has changed. Um, and, uh, and the gangsters are at large. And uh, as I said, this is not just Eastern Europe that's right in the center of Europe. Uh, and uh, my suspicion is uh, um, that uh, Austria is not better, but not worse than other uh, Western uh, democracies. And uh, that the problem of uh, corruption, the problem of political corruption, the problem of organized crime and money laundering is much larger than we think and uh, much larger also in Austria. And uh, you might think that this is not the case uh, because the first the surface looks so good. But if you just scratch a little bit, uh, it doesn't look good beneath the surface. So what we see, and, uh, and to conclude, uh, what we see is uh, in this case study, uh, and there's just one case, what we see in general is that political corruption, that organized crime, that money laundering systematically crosses national boundaries and borders. And uh, that governments are either not capable of keeping up and sometimes are not willing to keep up. Uh, and if this happens, uh, if this continues to happen, the rule of law will continue to be in retreat. The rule of law will be uh, further damage, justice loses, and the trust in the legal system will erode. And uh, let me remind you, the fact that laws work is not because they are passed in, in the parliament. It's not the way it works. The reason why the law works is because we have a culture of accepting laws passed by parliament a culture of accepting these laws and accepting that if you don't abide, you get sanctioned. That's a culture. And if this culture uh, erodes, if people don't feel any point in uh, abiding the rules and the laws, because there's always a group uh, not doing it and getting away with it, then the whole system, the whole system that we've, create, that we've created in the uh, past centuries uh, erodes and, well, is really in danger. And, um, well, th this is uh, uh, a short summary. Uh, I know I've been, I've been longer than, um, than uh, what we said before, but it's, it's very difficult to, um, to um, summarize these very difficult and complex and big cases in, in a few words and sentences, and I could probably talk hours about it. But it was a, a try to, uh, to present it to you in, in a few sentences and uh, to also convey the message uh, 
uh, that the problem is much larger than we think, that it's international and that we need to work together on an international basis uh, to confront this issue. And that's uh, one of the reasons why I'm here and uh, uh, that's, a one of, that's my offer and uh, that's my intention uh, to do, that we really work together on an international basis. Uh, and, uh, and I'm very glad in this sense uh, that I was invited to, the, to Washington to give me the opportunity to speak to you uh, because I think it's, it's not an opportunity to speak but it's an opportunity to, to start cooperating together and yes I'm looking forward to that. Thank you very much.